So at this point, we've taken the time to do it the hard way, honestly. We set up WAMP server, we created a database. So actually, you can pat yourself on the back because now you're a database administrator. And then we've installed WordPress, and we've played with themes a little bit. There's still a lot to learn, various settings to look at, but again, we've got four weeks for a basic class to work with. What I was doing at this point was simply sort of just uh, uh, bouncing around to different themes, and I segued to to other theme sites. <coughs> we'll talk more of this about more of this in detail later on, of course. Uh, what I want to do is mention a couple more things that I've got um, on the itinerary. Um, if you notice, one of the many menus that are on the left side, one of them is users. Hover over users. And here we have, give me a list of all users, add a new user, or edit your own profile. Let's take a quick look first at your profile. And this, this screen here is a little bit of customization and keyboard shortcuts, first name, last name, all of that. There's your email in case you want to change it, bio, password. So I'm just showing you here that you can come back to this screen here, users, your profile, to edit some of this basic stuff. Because right now, uh, I just set it up quickly. It doesn't have my name and any of that. Again, it's just a testing site. It doesn't, a, a testing site, it doesn't, it, isn't, it doesn't quite fully matter at the moment, but if you've got a WordPress site that you have access to in the real world, this is something to look at. Uh, I just finished a, a job for a client who hadn't updated her WordPress site since 2011. She needed a new update. So we you know, gathered her logins and found the right one, and we logged in, and then I was first to, of course, go in here and check some of the stuff. Who else has access to her site? And we saw the original developer of the site that she hasn't dealt with and doesn't have a good relationship with, with anymore was still having access to the site. So, let me show you what I mean here. Go to all users. There's only one user right now that has access to the site. And so when I helped that client, we looked here and there was still that old developer with the login information and the ability to make any change to the site and break it and hold it for ransom and all of that, you know, obviously thinking about the most extreme possibility. But here, this is useful for us at the moment because let's say me and, uh, and other people in my company are the ones that are going to make changes to my site. I'm the, the administrator. Notice my role here says administrator, and that's the top of the heap. The administrator can do everything. Add new themes, add products, delete products, add more users, delete customers, all of that stuff. Administrator has the, the top power. Just to see how this works, you've got users, add new, which you also see on the left side here, add new. But if you click users, add new, Here's how you can give more people access to this site. A username, an email, and so forth. We're not actually going to add one, but here's where you would add more people. And then very importantly, what's their role? Here it goes from least powerful to most powerful. If you give, gave someone the subscriber role, they really can't do anything. They can just view the site. That's it. They can't view anything in the dashboard there. A higher level is contributor and an, an author. These are, let's say, if you take the SEO class. In there I talk about that blogging is important. Writing articles on your website is important. Why? Well, we'll talk about it in detail later. Take the SEO class. But let's say I need other people to help me write. I'm going to run out of things to write. I want other people to help me write on my site. I can have a contributor, I can have an author, and they have slightly different roles. I don't have them memorized, but notice you can click um, somewhere to look those up, up on the help, on the top right corner, user roles. Authors can publish and manage their own posts, editors can publish posts, manage posts, blah blah blah. So on the top right corner there's always a little help item. But anyway, I'm saying if you're going to add other people to help you with your site, you have to give them a role. And be careful because the administrator role is the top one. 
conceivably you can add someone else as an administrator in your company, and then later on you fire them and they're mad, and they log back in and kick you out of your own site. It's obviously an extreme case, but that's the power of the admin role. You have more than one admin? Yeah. Yep. You can add as many as you want, but then more liability, perhaps. The editor is often this is often good. It's the second highest one. It lets you do just about everything except add or delete more people to the site, which is my, maybe all that you need. So this add user screen and list users, just giving you for your information. And let's say there was a user that you no longer want to have access to your site. You go back to add users, you select them, and then there's a there's an option hidden here. Delete. I don't believe you can delete yourself. Don't don't try it, but I don't think you can do it. But here is where you manage your, your users. Here is also um, this screen, and another screen is where you will see your customers who has bought your products and such. And so um, this is a very useful screen to mention. One little minor thing here, if you go back to your profile, there's a few color schemes here. There's the default scheme, there's light, there's blue and such. You say, okay, that's customization for my dashboard. Regular people will not see this. What's the point of this? I like to change the color screen depending on the version of the site I'm working on. I'm working on my local host version. I'm working on the version that's on this computer that I have access to only on this computer that is protected, not my real site on the internet. So I like to put the blue theme color. Eventually, when we put our site up on the real internet, victorsbakery.com slash wpadmin, and I'm on, my, I'm on my real version of the real site, I like to go to that version and put the sunrise, because it's like, right away. Be careful. You're editing the real version up on the real internet. This is just totally optional, but I like to do this. When I'm on WAMP or MAMP, when I'm on localhost, I like to have it on blue. This is the safe one. I can break it, no problem. And then when I'm on the real one online, danger. Be careful. That's optional. So let's look at a couple more dashboard-related things, and then we'll be right at the end of the day. Any questions so far? General questions? Let's go over here to hover over settings. We have a bunch of settings here. Let's look at the first one, general settings. When you were at visit site, it said at the top, Victor's Bakery. That's where you can change that if you want to call it something else. There's going to be a tagline right there, just another WordPress site. I recommend you do change this as soon as you can. Let me give you an SEO tip right here. Remember, search engine optimization. If you take that class, we spend four weeks talking about the nuances of SEO. And I'll sprinkle some of those things in this class. But one of the things, well, the big idea of SEO is to create a website that the search engines can find so that then they can show it to a person. If I'm on Google or Bing or Yahoo and I search, uh, you know, bakeries in Chula Vista, it would behoove me to have those keywords somewhere on my site. That's the most basic thing of SEO, having keywords on my site that people can find. Now, it's a four week long class, so there's much more to it than that. And what I can say for you here under tagline, think of a sentence full of keywords that people might search for. But not literally, don't just throw keywords there. Don't just put bakery, Eastlake, tasty, yummy. Don't put just keywords. Put real human sentences because the, the search engines are machines, but they, they also say, you should optimize your website for people. Not for, the, not for the tricks of the search engine, but for people. So here's my idea. I would write here, Victor's Bakery, 
something like family owned bakery in the heart of East Lake, California. Okay, I've got the keyword bakery. Someone could be searching for that. I've got family owned. I've got the location, East Lake, California. I've written a real sentence, a real tagline, you know, a slogan. Um, and it's got some of these words that people could search for. And there's a whole art and science and magic to SEO, and that's why we get into the into that class. But as I sprinkle these kinds of concepts into the class, I always think about in terms of what can I put on my website that people could find when they search. Think about how your customers are going to be searching. How do you want to get found? I'm yet another bakery in Eastlake, but here I've written family owned. What if I write, you know, uh, old world recipes with a modern twist? Victor's Bakery, right? Thinking about terms that people are searching for. People are searching for organic or gluten-free or healthy alternatives. So how can I write these things throughout my site to get people to find my site? This WordPress address stuff here, don't worry about that just yet. Later on, this will be, you know, victorsbakery.com. Don't worry about it now. Here's the email address of the administrator. Whenever something happens on your site, like someone adds a new comment or someone buys a product, you want to know about it. That's the administrator's email. The great thing about WordPress is that it's got a lot of great stuff built in. In the old days when my company was making websites for people, they would want then advanced things, such as the ability for people to comment on the site, or people to write uh, something in the discussion board, or to register. That stuff is complicated, and in old classic style, Dreamweaver was hard to do. Modern ways like WordPress, Squarespace, Wix, whatever, you can do it with the drop of a, with the tap of a button. Like here, let people register for my site, subscribe to my site. You just turn it on and you let people subscribe. Let them subscribe as a subscriber, as a contributor, as an administrator, careful about that. Uh, I'm not going to change anything here just yet. I'm just showing you. You can create membership. Time zone. We should set our time zone. This is not the right one. All our notifications will be off. We are not at UTC zero. Where in the world is UTC zero? Greenwich. Greenwich mean time. London. You want to change this over to Los Angeles. Or our UTC offset, which no one knows. But we'll go to. Los Angeles. A quick way to get to Los Angeles because there's lots and lots and lots of cities here. Just click on the little box and start typing LOS. Click on the little time zone box, type LOS, and it will take you to hopefully Los Angeles. I don't think there's a San Diego, San Marino. Date format, you can change it if you want. If you're using you know, non-US date formats, you can change it there. You can even do customized ones, as well as time formats, start of the week and such. So if you'd like to change any of that, you can. Site language, what's the, what's the language of your site? Mine's English, you can change that if you'd like. If you make any changes here, remember to click Save at the bottom. Any questions on this screen? We're going to skip the writing settings for the moment. The defaults are pretty good, so just leave uh, that alone. Let's go over to the reading section. Let's look at our reading settings. Uh, sometimes when a client uh, hires us or we talk about a site, about their site, and we say, we're going to make you a WordPress site. It's going to be great. Uh, they say, WordPress? I thought that was only for blogs. Well, with WordPress, you can create many kinds of websites. So I showed you the, the Texcoco site, aquí es texcoco.com. 
and I showed you the Italian site. I'll show you one other site. This is my own personal fun blog site, iancampus.com slash blog. And I show these three sites because these are the three types of, of, of WordPress sites. You've got the classic WordPress site, which is like a blog. A blog is simply a website with articles that are added on a regular basis. So one of my hobbies is comic books. I have this uh, blog about comics. So the latest article, February 6th, pushes down the older one which pushes down the older one, etc. This is a classic blog. New articles push down the older articles. WordPress can do this. And WordPress does this by default. Our setting right here, front page. I, sh I wish they would say, what does your front page display? Your latest posts. By default, when we add a new article, it'll push down the old one. That's the default of WordPress. The other way to use WordPress is like I showed here with... Oh, actually, let me show you this one. The other way to use WordPress is like this, with this website. A static home page. And I don't mean, you know, this slideshow, that's not, that doesn't mean that it's not static. This is static because it's one thing visible on the front. Yes, the slideshow changes, but this front page stuff doesn't, doesn't change. On the blog, when I write a new article, it's going to change. This one from this website, this is a static home page. WordPress lets you do that also, to have a static home page. That's the second option here. We can't do it completely yet, however, because it says, okay, let's put a static home, static front page, and display this page always, a home page. We don't have a home page yet, so we can't really select it. And then put all my blogs, all my articles into the post page. I don't have a placeholder for my articles yet. So I can't fully set this up as a static page yet. I don't have placeholders yet. So we won't do it yet. We'll still leave it on a plain old classic blog. Later on, you might want the static home page, or you might want what's in the middle, because there's two, there's three sides to this coin. And there are three sides of a coin, aren't they? The, the little rim, the little edge of the coin, right? The third side of the coin is this one. This is a hybrid. This is a static home page and a blog home page. Because yes, you have all of this flashy content that changes, but this stuff doesn't change very often. You know, this stuff doesn't change so often. But here's the blog. That does change. We just added this brand new article one or two days ago. So this is the hybrid. It's got the static content and the updated blog content. And this usually relies on the specific theme. So there's no option here exactly that says choose a hybrid layout. Hybrid layout is basically the static page with the proper setup. We'll talk about that later. Oftentimes I'm going to give the answer, it depends on the theme. People ask me, well, why doesn't my site do this? Or how do I do that? Or how do you get yours to do that? And often my answer is, it depends on the theme. The theme is very powerful. It comes with your design and features and widgets and plugins and all of this great stuff. So that's why it's often hard to answer that question. How do I do that? It depends on the theme. We'll talk about that stuff. But those are the three ways to use WordPress. Classic blog, static site, hybrid site. And later we will set it to a static site once we create placeholders. There's a couple things about blogs here. These defaults are fine for the moment. How many blogs to show on your page? 10 at a time, 2 at a time, 12 at a time, whatever. If someone subscribes to your blog, how many do you want to send to them? 10 at a time, whatever. Do you want to send the full article to their inbox or just a, a summary? Here I do recommend you put summary. And this is for usability and SEO. If someone subscribes to your blog, you don't want to send them all 10 articles at once. It'll feel like spam. So maybe decrease that one. 
but whatever you choose there, you, you, you still don't really want to send them the whole article on their email. Not because you're going to clutter their email, but because then they have no incentive to come back to your website. If you only put a summary and you send that uh, latest article to everyone, it actually happens automatically, they will get a little snippet, a couple sentences to read, and if they like that, then they will click and come back to your site. And in this class and many of my other classes, I, I, I mention over and over the importance of bringing traffic to your site for various reasons. And one, for example, I'm going to sell my product on my website, not on that email. I'm going to sell my product on the website. The website's got the shopping cart. So if I'm writing articles and getting subscribers to my blog, and I send out an email that then says, we're having a sale this Saturday, the summary They'll only get the summary and they still will click to come back for the full content on the site to buy. So I highly recommend you set that to summary. As for how much to send out, that's up to you. But definitely on, on that put summary. Yes? Is there some other uh, content that I have to write or is the system automatically? The, the system will take automatically the first few pieces of your article, which might not be the best. So we have the ability in a place where we're editing the article to craft the snippet, the excerpt. Did you have the same? Yes. Um, so is this kind of a, another way of sending a mass email? In a sense, but it's not as powerful as something that's dedicated to it, like MailChimp or Constant Contact. This is more... This is RSS. It's more for subscribing to it, as in a person has to actively subscribe. But then when you write a new article, it'll send it out. It's not really like I have a brand new email that I want to send to everyone. It's more like I'm writing an article about something, and then that will get sent out to all the subscribers. It is RSS, but it does go to people's inboxes if they select that option. How do you incorporate all the mailchimp Incorporate what? The mailchimp is Sorry, I for that. She that wants to incorporate mailchimp into. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, many of these things. Whatever we don't have built into our settings, there's always going to be some sort of plugin for it. So when we talk about plugins, these are these extra features that we add to WordPress. I'm going to save that. Oh, and look, uh, one more thing. There's the spot right there. Eventually, when we put this up online for real, we want to turn that off. It's kind of backwards. Turn it on to yes, discourage search engines, and turn it off to no, don't discourage search engines. It's like when we vote and they say vote yes so that we know don't fund that project. You know, that sort of thing that happens. So you want to leave that on for the moment because it's not a real site. When we get to it, on a real site on the internet, we want to turn that off, or else the search engines might not find us. No traffic, no sales. Save that. Let's look at discussion, discussion settings. A lot of them here, but I'm just going to mention a couple that I recommend. If you, if you see here, on default article settings. In a, in, next time we'll have more of a time to talk about pages and posts, the difference between them. Big difference. They're both collectively articles, basically. And in this section, allow people to post comments on new articles. So in a nutshell, a page is a screen, and I think this is in my handout, number two. A page is basically a screen that doesn't change much, like an about page, a contact page, you know, about us, whatever. These screens on your site that don't change much are usually pages. Posts are the articles, the blog articles that you're going to write on a regular basis, once a month, once a week, twice a day, whatever those posts, those articles, and they kind of chose very generic terms, unfortunately, but posts are the screens of content that change on a regular basis, and pages are the ones that do not. They're both articles. 
And I want that when I write a great article about something, I want people to comment. It's good for SEO, which we'll talk about later, but I want people to comment on my articles. And it says here, allow people to post comments on new articles. Good. I want people to comment on my great new article. The problem is that this is also, it says articles, and I just said that WordPress counts posts and pages as articles. So technically here, if you turn that on, you're going to let people comment on your About Us page, and comment on the Contact page, and the Home page, and weird things like that. So if you turn that off, that still doesn't solve the issue, because this says, allow people to post comments on new articles. These settings may be overridden for individual articles. So yes, you can turn on and off per screen the ability for people to comment. We'll see how to do that later. Because right now, technically, we might have a contact page where people can comment on the contact. Weird. If we turn this off, no new future articles may, pe may people comment on unless I turn it back on, which I may forget. So I might be shooting myself in the foot. I might turn this off because I still have to build the about page, the contact page, the products page, and I don't want comments on those. But if I turn that off and forget to turn it on, then people will not be able to comment on any new articles. I shot myself in the foot. There's no easy answer for me to give on this. The way I do it is I leave this on because I don't want to forget to turn that on for my, for my blog posts. And then I manually, as we will see later, I go into the pages and turn off the ability to comment on the home page, the about page, the contact page, or any page that doesn't need it. Usually none of your pages need comments. Your posts need comments. But this is the nuclear option. It's either on or off for everything. Leave it on for everything, and later we will turn it off as necessary. And the great thing about WordPress is that we can let anyone comment on our content. But the bad thing about WordPress is that we can let anyone comment on our content. Any crazy person can comment on our, on our posts. So, if you scroll down to the section before a comment appears, comment must be manually approved. I highly recommend to turn that one on. It's off by default. I highly recommend to turn it on. <clears throat> let any crazy person write any crazy thing, but it will not appear until I approve it. I will get an email right in my phone. New comment. And I get a little preview of it, and I have approve, deny, spam. And if it's a bad comment, I just put spam and it never shows up on my site. It never will show up anyway. It's going to be in limbo until I take an action. I don't have to take any action and nothing will show up. And yes, this does mean extra work. What if you do have a popular site, you're writing a lot of blog posts and people are commenting a lot? There's plugins that will help it help us make it easy help it make it easier for us. But I do recommend to turn this one on at the minimum so that crazy comments don't show up on your site. Forget crazy people writing crazy things. Spammers writing crazy things. Because spammers have spam bots, little pieces of software that are scouring the internet 24 hours a day, looking for websites where they can comment, where they can inject. At best, they're spam links to go buy genuine authentic Rolex watches. At worst, injecting viruses or you know, malicious code into your site. We'll have better ways of cybersecurity later, but this is one of the basic ones. Everything else, these defaults are fine. Um, everything's fine. I'm just mentioning those too the comments and moderate it and everything else is good. Save that. I'm going to skip media. Media, all these defaults on the left of media are fine. Take a quick look at permalinks. For the moment on permalinks, this will just be informational. Don't change anything yet. The information here is that oftentimes by default, the permalink structure, which is just a fancy way of saying the addresses. 
permalinks, <clears throat> the addresses of your site, the permalinks. By default, oftentimes, they are ugly permalinks. That means that you're going to get this default of victorsbakery.com slash p127. And that number comes from the entry in the database. Everything that our site is made out of is in a database. The theme is an entry in the database. The products, the customers, everything. The pages. Internally, my about page is entry 179. So oftentimes, the default of WordPress is this ugly structure, numbers. And that's worthless and detrimental for SEO. The default of numbers is bad for SEO because numbers are gibberish. Numbers don't mean anything to the search engines. A page that is called upon my address bar for sale is much better for the search engines than 1279. So don't change anything here, but I'm telling you, on your own WordPress site, if yours still says default, that might be part of the reason why you don't get traffic to your site, because the search engines see a site that is not optimized, and this is a spam tactic. This is a technique that any spammer can make a website and leave it default and start selling cheap authentic Rolex watches. But you're not a spammer. You're a real real company. So you're gonna choose any other of these because notice day and name is gonna have a real name, a real word that the search engines can look at and analyze and understand, not a number. Any of these will work. And there's an arguments all the time about which is best. The short answer is that they're all best except for default. That one's terrible. A lot of people really, really vouch for the post name. The name of your website slash the name of the article. About us. Shop. Cat food, 10 pounds. Whatever. A lot of people vouch for that one. That's great. People say that this one up here is also good. The month and the date. Especially if you're a blogger and going to write a lot, this one's good because it's got the name of your article. Top 10 WordPress plugins. That's great for SEO. And then you've got a date. You know, meaningful numbers. So any of these will work. Oftentimes in my company, we do post name. But again, don't change any of this yet. Oftentimes in my company, we do post name. Secondly, we often do a month name. But any will work except default. And custom is kind of advanced. I'm not going to really get into that one, which seems to be my default at the moment, which is fine. But again, don't change anything here yet until I talk about something later. But this is one of the secrets of SEO. If you've got a WordPress site that exists and you haven't changed this, that could be hurting you. In custom is where you would write your own scheme of links. It's pretty advanced. The default that's here is fine. And you, for most of us, post name will work, but we don't want to change it yet. And then down on optional, again, that's more advanced. Don't worry. So I wanted to give a quick overview of some settings. We'll go back to some other ones a little bit later. You really only have to deal with these once or twice. And then it's actually about building content and such, and we'll get to that. But uh, we're getting very close to the end of the day, and we've covered a lot, and there's still a lot to cover. Three more weeks. Any general questions on the things we've talked about today? If you want to practice at home, what you want to do is, is Definitely follow Sheets 1 and 2. You download the WAMP server, you download the WordPress software, and follow the instructions here, and you can do it at home. If you're on a Mac, you want the Mac instructions, which is in the fold, which are in the folder in the Mac folder. Now, we're doing this work, and this seems amazing, and we're getting ready to go. And then when we come back next week and, and, and come back in here, it's all gone hate to break it to you. But these labs, because they're public labs, many classes come in and out of this room. These computers have a software called Deep Freeze. The whole time we've been here, on the bottom corner, the little polar bear has been staring at us. That little polar bear is Deep Freeze. These computers are frozen. 
anything we do to them, anything, any changes we make, as soon as we restart the computer, go away. That's not so good, because all this work that we did, we're going to have to do it again next time. But it's good because what if someone gets a virus on this computer? We restart it and it's fine. What if someone vandalizes it? We restart it and it's fine. It is cumbersome for us that it erases everything. And on the first day, yes, we will lose everything that we did and we'll have to do it again next time. But the next time after that, we will save our work and take it with us and not start over. And unfortunately, you cannot simply drag your folder to your flash drive and take it with you. It's not going to quite work. The work that we've done today exists in multiple pieces that we need to combine into an archive. It's a bit of a process. I've got a handout for it. We'll do it next time. It's going to be good practice to start over again next time, but I don't want to start over every time. We're going to create an archive next time, take it with us, and then if you take this archive of what we do in class, you can pick it up at home and keep working on it at home. And then when we come back the week after that, we start with that archive and we don't have to start over. So we will lose what we did here, but it's not a big loss so far. When we come back next time, we'll, we'll give you more handouts, we'll do more work, we'll go further, and we'll keep uh, on track. Again, the syllabus is what I hope to accomplish, so we're on track so far. That's it for the moment. Thank you for coming, and we'll do it again next time.